Hello everybody, today I have the pleasure of being here with Corey Pitzer. Uh, again, another uh, introduction that Paulo Gomes helped me to find another great mind. I have access to some speeches from Corey, some conference, and I think it makes all the sense having him here uh, with us to share his knowledge. And Corey, thank you for accepting the invitation. I know you are in Canada, it's freezing over there. In Brazil, it's so hot <laughs> now, it's yes. summertime. Uh, but I wanna ask you, first of all, uh, a little bit about your background. How did you become a, a, a famous consultant? And, and so tell, tell us a little bit about your, your experience in this new view field. <laughs> okay, no, that's a, that's a pleasure, you know. It's uh, nice to, to meet with you. And um, yeah, my, my career started um, in South Africa when I was uh, first trained as a human resource manager or I was trained as a psychologist. And then I went into human resource management for a platinum company and um, Impala Platinum, which is a big, uh, second largest in the world. Um, and I arrived on this, mine, com this mining company, there's 48,000 people. And uh, the manager of my mine that I was allocated to told me to go and work on the ground uh, to understand what the real people do uh, because he didn't like HR. So I worked on the ground uh, and it really, looking back, it really changed um, everything in my life around safety, uh, the thinking about safety, because then I was appointed into safety by him eventually. Um, and, and then I was working as a safety training manager for, for this company when a big disaster happened in this, in another division, the gold division, and it was called uh, the Kinross mine in South Africa, 177 people killed. And as a result of that, I was appointed as the group risk manager for a company that was then called Gencore, which later became Billiton, which later became BHP Billiton, as you know, a big organization. Um, and the first thing that, that I've done in this organization was to develop um, a process that was called the Gencore Safety Performance Review. And it was a, a, a mine management team. We visited them for a week. Uh, a colleague of mine went the week before, talked to the workers, did a con uh, culture survey, perception survey. And then in this five days, we did a few things, elimination of fatalities process, and we subjected the management team to the views of workers, to, uh, to let them understand how different the workers experience their management instructions. And it was a five day process, but in the end, when I look back at it, it was basically the human and organizational performance management, the HOP process that we did for the mine team. So we would do this at 60 mines right throughout South Africa. And, and it really started my thinking about safety uh, as different from systems and not different, but beyond practices and systems and, and procedures. It is about the leadership and people in the organization. And so we were actually busy with the new view of safety since 1986. And so when I started consulting in 1994, uh, people outside of this company thought, you know, this is a bit crazy. This is, this is weird safety. This is crazy. Uh, I'm a maverick. And um, uh, so, but there are a few companies that started to take on board what we say. Uh, start working with our concepts. And uh, as time progressed, it became mainstream thinking. It's now today, it's new view uh, safety. But I've always worked inside the organization and inside this concept. So I developed a lot of my own ideas about it, uh, you know, which is different from uh, what you would say new view of safety today. And, uh, and, and we'll get into those kind of ideas a little bit later, but that's, that's how I started my company. I went to Australia for uh, my first consulting project 
and I lived there for 18 years. And then I came to Canada for another consulting project as a bigger one. And then I'm now here for 14 years. So my life has been shifted and changed by my, uh, by my work. Perfect. Corey, yes, your, your first words gave me an idea uh, about, so now we are facing, I, I saw this movement in, in US and Europe in the beginning, but now I'm seeing this in Brazil as well, a kind of uh, polarization between the new, the safety one, if, if we can call it just to make it easier, and the safety to professionals and, and viewers. Uh, and I think it doesn't contribute at all for the progress of the, the organizations. So uh, I have some, I have heard some criticism about HOP uh, because it doesn't have a, a theoretical background, if we can, can say. Uh, so have you experienced something similar or during the implementation in some company like companies or leadership diffusing the ideas because of the, the this polarization, what's better if it's safe to one or safe to two, if you can use both. Give your thoughts on, on this, please. So we've never talked about safety one, safety two in our work with companies um, because it was just the safe map way. This is how we define safety. So for instance, right from the start of my career, I've never defined safety as the absence of accidents, um, which is the safety one definition. And, and if you look back at it, but. The safety two so-called definition of the presence of capacity, to me, that's also falling short of what real safety is. And I take it back to my first eight months when I worked underground. It was there that I discovered, and we call it deep safe, just as a label. Uh, and that label tells us that safety uh, happens in the readiness to respond to risk. And that's our definition. And that's changed everything we've always done. So when you look at what is readiness to respond to risk, well, it is readiness in the systems of the organization. It is readiness in the culture of the organization. It is readiness in the procedures, but most important, it's readiness in the people who deal with it in every day. So that led me to, well, how do you become ready? As a, as a worker. Now, underground, we worked in a stope, a workplace that is 39 inches high and pitch dark. And in that environment, we became risk competent. And that's a bit different because what we're saying is we should become competent to take risks. Now, what safety one and safety two tells you, you shouldn't take risks. We should avoid risk taking. Well, our uh, philosophy is then you can't do anything. And if you, be, if you become skilled in taking risks, uh, you actually start to become ready and you can anticipate. There is no more powerful risk management system than a person that is risk ready, risk competent. And therefore, we've always, uh, I mean, the safety two notion is uh, you, uh, workers are not the problem, they're the solution. But to us, that's obvious. It's extremely obvious. We've always worked with this notion that workers are the strongest link in the safety chain because they deal with risks that are created upstream and they can't solve those risks, but they have to be ready for them. It has to be solved upstream. So I'm, I'm always a little bit uncomfortable with the labels of safety one, safety two, new view, safety differently. To us, I've never had it anything in any different way in, in our thinking. And we call it deep safe. Yes, it's, I agree with you. It's just a matter of, of labeling something. And each author, they, they want to like post their seal on, on the names and, and that has commercial issues as well. But in one, in one of your speeches, I... I I realize you, you said something about redundancy that it's really, really nice. And, and I, I agree totally that most of the companies, they, they think that redundancy, redundancy is the, the solution for everything. So uh, one or two layers of protection or two employees 
doing the same thing. If one fails, we have another one. And then we are just allocating resource ineffectively. And then, so you can tell better than me. So give me your, give us your, your thoughts. I think it was awesome, the, the definition and the idea you have about re redundancy that for most of the companies is still today is the solution for, for everything. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, I think when we start talking about building redundancy into the business, uh, system redundancy, uh, backups, technology, more people, spotters for risk and things like that, we're actually putting into place complexity. We're putting into place layers that create what, what is in our uh, uh, thinking, probably one of the biggest problems. It creates confidence an overconfidence that we are protected. All the layers around us are giving us this notion that, well, I just have to stay within the rules. And as I do the job, I've got my, uh, my processes, my procedures. Well, a lot of people are actually killed inside the rules, inside the compliance. And if you think about it, what then becomes a cultural problem the culture of the organization becomes so cult-like, like a cult, that people are completely drawn into it. And, and safety, in some ways, uh, have shown, uh, you know, like examples of being a cult. Um, and, and in that circumstance, the worker at the front end loses that capability to be, rest, to be, to be ready for risk. So the organization that we propagate is the culture of restlessness, the organization is always on the lookout. And so if you think about it, let's, let, me, let me use a simple example that I always use. If you cross the road as a, as, a, as a pedestrian, at the pedestrian crossing with the traffic light, you're now protected. It is in that zone that people become paralyzed by the protection. If you are a jaywalker, how do you cross the road? You look very carefully for a gap between the cars. And when you go, you go fast. You are focusing. That's risk competence. Inside the pedestrian zone, that's where you find organizations increasingly experiencing catastrophic events because they become so overconfident about their redundancy. So that's my, my take on that. If you take the redundancy away and you... Uh, I, I've heard an interesting story about the, uh, the difference in the uh, uh, American uh, systems of uh, space travels, you know, the space shuttles. Uh, and I was told this when I was on a visit there. The space shuttles had, I think, four computer backup systems. If the one fails, the next one will take over, and the next one, and the next one. So the redundancy. The Russian system had one computer. I'm not sure this is 100% true, but this is what I was told. The Russian system had one computer system. And when they were criticized, but what if it fails? Their response was, it will not fail. Now, that is how the organization is competent in what they do. And the Russian vaccine validates this speech as well. You know? So they, they had no yes. phase three, so it's ready. We believe you can vaccinate everybody. You know? So they speed and, up the and I, be, I believe it's 90% effective or something yeah. like that. <laughs> Uh, and, and your example fits perfectly with me. So I suffered an incident, a car incident. I, I was crushed by a car and I was a pedestrian at the, the safety lane, the, the red light. But when I, I was 12 years old, I guess. And I was thinking about a girlfriend that I was dreaming for <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> and then the truck stopped and, and then he called me, you can come. And the light was ready and I was in the safe walk. But there was a car uh, behind it, but in he, in, in order to avoid uh, hitting the, the truck, he did like this and hit me in the middle. I was above the, the this, and everything you said just happened to me because I was relaxed. I was in the light, the the safety place, the radio was uh, ready. The guy gave me the the sign I I, I needed, <laughs> and <laughs> it just happened. So perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right, another question uh, that most of, of the, the viewers of this channel uh, usually do is that uh, 
safety professionals and companies, they don't know how to measure their systems. So usually they don't know if they are doing a good or bad job. It's only uh, most of the leadership, they are just basing the safety system uh, by uh, if somebody gets hurt or if somebody dies and, and everything. And also you mentioned this in your speech that we have never been safer and we have never killed so many people as we are doing uh, nowadays. So could you explain this a little deeper for us, please? Um, that's a very uh, fascinating uh, uh, question. Um, if you look at uh, the organizations today, um, you know, in terms of our focus on safety, uh, like I said, you know, we've become very sophisticated and very focused on safety. But it's almost as if the more focused we become on safety, the more we demand safety and especially demand the absence of accidents, because that's our measure. And we have to completely reject any measurement of safety as the absence of accidents, because accidents happen in very safe organizations. And some very unsafe organizations don't have accidents. Uh, they may just be lucky. You know, this is, this is the process that we are now in a situation where accidents are actually rare events. So we don't have any means of testing the system to know that the system is operating. So how do you do that? Well, there's, there's, some, uh, there's several ways, but for us, the most um, comparable way, the most uh, valid way, if I can put it like that, is to conduct a perception analysis in the organization. And that we have ourselves, but there are others too, is a sophisticated instrument these days. You can actually construct a whole analysis of an organization and see where the competencies of readiness to respond to risk culturally, systematically, uh, actually exist in the organization. And uh, so as you do this, you can create a baseline, you can create more analysis as you go forward, but you, you don't, you will never get a finger on the pulse every day because things will fluctuate, there's regression to the mean uh, and so on. But you can actually do a baseline and then you can do a follow-up survey and you can create capabilities as you go forward based on what you've identified. Now I've said you can never have your finger on the pulse, but the sophistication of these instruments are these days in such a way that, you, that we now have the capability to measure how it may change on a short-term basis. And uh, we've developed some, uh, some tools and techniques that we're going to launch um, soon, where we will have the perception measures of employees in the organization on a regular basis. And with that, you can actually de develop trends. So how do you, how do you know uh, that you're doing well? Um, you, you, you're not gonna be told you're doing well by not having accidents. Uh, that is a, is, is, is a fallacy that I think we, most organizations still trap by it. Most organizations still measure trends in, 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 in lagging indicators uh, and make decisions upon that or reward and punish people on the basis of that. And yet, uh, it's got absolutely no validity to it. Yes, I think that uh, the councils for the companies, oil companies, oil and gas, chemical and, and others, they have a, a really relevant position in this situation because they compare companies based on those indicators, those lagging indicators. And then they So CEOs, what do people do? They lie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, it's not an easy thing to do. I think we are we will always uh, control this, but I think the focus for the system shouldn't be this. Uh, Corey, if you would name uh, the main uh, like activities or, or systems or help that SafeMap can provide to companies that are facing this plateau when they are starting this change for, for a more, more relevant uh, system going, on, going uh, above the, the legislation, the bureaucracy, uh, what would be the, the solutions or, or the help you, you guys could provide for companies in this situation? 
to go further in, in these safety systems? So everything we do starts with, a, um, with an analysis of the safety culture in the organization. It is, a, it is a, a, what is the blueprint of the organization and we understand what are the shortfalls, the gaps and so on. From there, we assist the organization to restate, to revitalize what it wants in safety, its vision statement. You know, it's not what's on the wall on a poster, but what people know on a day to day basis, uh, because that statement is very important. What why do you want to be safe in, your, in this organization? Well, if people think you want to be safe because you want a good accident record, they're going to give you that by hiding accidents away, for instance. So we, we will do a lot of work on that. Then we support the organization to change the strategies, the, 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 the strategic level of interventions, because they have to be aligned with what we want to achieve in terms of a restated vision. And then from that, the next step is you have to now align the behaviors and practices of leaders to the strategies in the organization, because they create everything. Their behaviors are being seen by workers, by the supervisors in the organization. And if they're not aligned, nothing changes, nothing goes forward. The step after that is to, what are the human performance management systems that need to be changed? How we discipline people, how we incentivize people. All of those things have to be aligned with your strategic focus. And then two more steps for us is a very important is the re-engineering of, of risk systems. Our safety systems are quite antiquated, if you think about it. They come out of the 60s and 70s, uh, and there are so many more advanced risk systems that uh, we've developed that puts the organization on a, a very progressive, proactive level. And then finally is the competence of people. The training of people in understanding risk, and we have a, a six, uh, we, we call it the six Y lens that we train people in how we overlook risk, how we underestimate risk, how we balance risk, how we uh, take risk because of rewards, how we tolerate risk. Those key aspects is what makes people more competent in the, in the workplace. So when all of these things are done, uh, the organization is on a, on a road to progressive change in safety. Perfect. Uh, most of the viewers of this channel are safety professionals. They are from safety technicians to directors, VPs and everything. But uh, specifically to the, those field employees, like safety field employees, the guys that are in the, in the shop floor, uh, what, how can they be more relevant to the safety system? How can they contribute for the safe of the people that they are uh, working for? Because I've been realizing most of the time the safety professionals, they are becoming, they are going like farther from, from the employees and coming closer to the, the management. So they are more thinking about protecting their jobs than their employees. Uh, I don't know if you agree with this. Uh, uh, sorry. Let, let, let me just uh, let me just restart my camera. Oh yeah. So uh, to have an answer for this question, do you agree first? Do you agree with this thinking that prof safety professionals are more concerned about their jobs in some cases than with the people in the in the floor? Uh, and if so, how can they change this a little bit in order to, to do what they are hired to do? Um, I, think, I think it depends on organizations, uh, how that will play out in organizations. Some organizations, I think that will be true. Uh, organizations, some of the organizations that I work with, uh, they have a very high value on the role of the safety professional in their organization. And they, they uh, support them very strongly. Um, but if an organization is not supporting its, its safety, well, what happens is that the, if an organization sees safety is a responsibility of the safety department, 
and they have to make sure that everything is safe so that I can do my job. I can produce what I need to produce. In that environment, the, 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 the safety professional is going to try and please the management as much as they can in order to make things happen. But if the organization truly values its uh, safety professional, uh, they will integrate safety into the work processes, uh, into the operating model of the organization. And that's one of our philosophies is that safety should become invisible. It shouldn't be bolted on redundance, uh, redundancies as we spoke about. It should be upstream planned meticulously by the operational people. And the more that's done, you know, the, the, the more highly valued a role of the supervisor of the safety person will be because they will advise and they will guide and they will support the production process, the operational process in a constructive way. Otherwise, they're there to put barriers into place. They're there to slow things down so we can be more safe. We should actually be speeding up the operating process as a safety professional by making people more competent and making them more va highly valued in the organization. Let me give you an example. If you think about, you know, uh, uh, the hurdler, the person who runs in a hundred yards, uh, 100 meter hurdling race, they have to jump over the hurdles and the production focus is jump as low as you possibly can so that you can go as fast as you possibly can. The safety professional says, no, no, you're gonna jump into the, into the hurdle, you're gonna jump high, create big space between you and the hurdle. So that slows you down. So what is the ideal situation? We have to have a person, a production process that barely clears those hurdles all the time. So we gotta work closer to the edge. The safety professional, should have a role in that. They should create that capability and not say, don't innovate, because that's actually what we say, you know? We say to people, don't, don't break rules. Don't push the boundaries in your work. Well, if you want to innovate, how do you innovate? You break rules. People who invented things didn't follow the rules. They, they look outside the rules. Now in safety, that's a problem. We have to give people the confidence to be able to do that and the space to be able to do that. That I think is the ideal role of the safety professional. Yes, I totally agree. The time is gone already. Unfortunately, when the conversation is good, uh, this happens all the time. So I want to thank you so much, Corey, for your time, your, your masterpiece on this uh, kind of new situation. And uh, before we go, I'd like you to give your contacts and tell how people can uh, reach you out, what kind of service can you guys provide to, mainly for the Brazilians that are the majority of our public over here? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we have an office in Sao Paulo. Um, uh, our representative there is uh, Michel Politi, um, and uh, he has done some work in the past there for companies there like Mosaic and uh, support me with other work that I, I've been in Brazil myself many times. So our company is www.safemap.com. And uh, if people access that, they can see very clearly, uh, you know, where we are and what kind of uh, capabilities we have. Perfect. I want to thank you again and stay safe. Have a nice weekend.